I play a lot of RPG Maker games on this channel, and a term I bring up quite often as I play said games are the RTP, or the default RM. Although, I don't think I've actually explained in detail what these terms actually mean. RPG Maker is a very unique kind of software as far as game dev softwares go, and that it actually comes with a bunch of starter assets. These assets are the RTP. To be honest, I don't think many people actually know what this stands for. I found like one source that claimed it was runtime package, but it wasn't from an official source, so to say. I personally call it the default RM, however. RM standing for RPG Maker. Now, something even more unique to RPG Maker is that these assets you have permission to use in your own games, even commercial ones. The only caveats is that you have to have bought the RPG Maker version those assets are from, since the license to them is tied to that version's purchase, and the game you make must be made of an Enterbrain property. So, basically RPG Maker. And these asset packs are enormous. Depending on the versions, some are larger than others, but in general, these things have the works. Monster sprites, battle backgrounds, icon sets, music, magic and ability animations, and assets for characters and NPCs, not only for overworld sprites, but portrait sprites as well. And some versions even come with a custom character generator, so you can kinda make your own as well. And they're all really professionally created as well. This on paper is amazing. Sometimes you just want to make a game despite having no artistical talent. These assets allow you to do that. And sometimes even people with that kind of talent will splash assets in to save time or just because they look cool. However, this does lead to some problems with RPG Maker as a brand, as since literally anyone can use them, what ends up happening is you get a lot of amateur devs making a lot of shoddy games with them. I'm not kidding, even within the RPG Maker community, these assets have become sort of a meme specifically for this reason. And it's really unfortunate too, because like I said, they're really professionally made. Although, I have seen games use them to great advantage, and today, I specifically want to see if I can find more. So what I did is this. I went to itch.io and I found five free indie projects, and I kind of picked them at random too. Literally all I did was search RPG Maker and clicked on the five first games I saw that appear like they were made mostly using default RM assets. And the five games I picked were The Blinding of the Light, James vs. the World, Crown of Chaos, Dude Knight, I, I can't wait to play that one, and Wayfarers. I didn't invent these games at all before this video either. I don't know how good they are, how long they are, which might come back to bite me because, you know, RPGs are long, or even if they're just dumb meme games or something. They're made using default art assets that came with the software, and that's really all I care about. I want to find a good game that utilizes them. So without further ado, let's get started on this selection and uh, see if any of these are any good. Our first game up for judgment is Crown of Chaos by Squarf Bandito. <laughs> that name is really fun to say for some reason. A mysterious quest awaits you. Everything and everyone may not be as they seem. Are dreams truly reality? Or is it the other way around? What seems like an innocent adventure? Is there more? This is currently a game I have stopped working on, but it may change in the future where I can spend the love and attention it deserves. Please feel uh, free to report any bugs or issues you have, or even any suggestions for future progression. Okay, let's see what we got here. Finally, I am here. Line break. The Temple of Heralds. Red will be so proud. So, we play as this girl- Oh, no, apparently we're not actually- Who's this? Okay, so, this character is Red, and that girl we just saw is Sapphire. I don't think that's how you spell Sapphire, but it's a name, so you never know. And she's coming to meet us, but this guard is confronting her. It's clear we're supposed to help her, but let's look around first. Maybe there's like some treasure we can find in... Wait. That's the exact same cutscene I just saw. It appears that the dev put an event here that triggers the cutscene when you stand on it, which explains why you start on that tile, but forgot to turn it off? You can do this really easily with cell switches, just saying, let's go help her. Harlow, let her through. She's my friend. If not, I'll go and tell Priest Gerald that you called the Goddess of Light a crazy woman. Two minutes in, we're already threatening the Royal Guard. That appeared to have worked, though, and we're reunited with our friend who gives us a care package and then, uh, 
A plot dump, I guess. Okay, so <laughs> right off the bat, it's pretty clear that this one isn't of the greatest quality. There are typos all over the place. The story is incredibly breakneck, though not in a Tumio funny kind of way. Heck, the opening town actually looks really familiar, so I did some digging, and it turns out that it's actually a sample map. That is so lazy. So, the actual plot is about sealing the god of darkness, uh, Viscardi. <laughs> Quite the threatening name there. And in order to do so, Red and Sapphire must travel to four dungeons of earth, fire, wind, and water in order to find four keys they can use to seal him. To be frank, that is about as cookie cutter as an RPG plot can possibly get, which in turn gives me the impression that this is an RPG that strives in either its battle system or its characters. It's like a Venn diagram, I swear. These types of games very rarely have all three. And you know what? That's kind of true here. The actual fighting is not half bad, if a bit bare to be honest, the encounter rate isn't through the roof, and the game is smart enough to make your heal spell really inexpensive. And the first boss is actually quite balanced as well. The game also does that thing where you can purchase weapons for characters that haven't even joined your party yet. I can imagine some people wouldn't like this because it kind of spoils future events in the game, but honestly, it's something that's never really bothered me. If anything, it gets me excited for future events and provides an extra option for people trying to min-max the game. And honestly, that's kind of all there is here. After you get the first key, you hit off to the next town, and that's basically the end of the demo right there. Overall, I think this has potential, although it really doesn't do much to stand on its own right now. That's probably my biggest problem with it. Now, the thing about making games with the RTP assets is that by default, you're going to have to do something to stand out. And this game kinda lacks that. I feel it needs some kind of core mechanic or gimmick to make itself more interesting. There is one really weird part of this game, however, that just kinda feels off and even pretty immersion breaking. So in this church right before the end of the last town, you meet this guy who tells you to wake up and then asks if you're a boy or a girl. You then start playing as this entirely new character in what I think is supposed to be the real world. This kid talks about a new game he has, and you can explore his kitchen and the like, and then you meet this girl in the park where they have the vaguest conversation I've ever heard, and then the game ends. It came out of nowhere and actually left me with, with some pretty big questions right at the end. But then again, thinking about it, the game's description did mention something along the lines of dreams and reality being blurred together, and that man did tell you to wake up, so... Is this game supposed to be a dream? Honestly, if that's what the dev is going for here, then that's actually pretty interesting. Dare I say, it might be that perfect recipe for that added kick this game kinda needs to stand out more. It needs to do more than just be a dream world though, in a real world to be interesting, however. Like, maybe characters in the real world could correspond to characters from your dreams, kinda like in Nino Kuni, or maybe actions you take in the real world could influence your dreams, like the kind of abilities you get and stuff. Honestly, there's a lot of potential there, and if this dev ever does want to continue this, that'd be honestly something I'd be very much looking forward to. Oh, and because I'm nitpicky sometimes, here's one last thing I want to bring up right before I'm done talking about this one. What in the world is up with the tags for this game? Because while there aren't many, most of them are very confusing and even outright wrong. Like, it has the female protagonist tag here, even though Sapphire is more of a side character. Um, there's also tags for comedy, mystery, and spooky for some reason. Was this game supposed to be funny or scary in any way? I didn't take it that way, and it certainly is not a mystery game as well. I don't know, it's just something I found odd. Properly tag your games, people. Alright, so with that out of the way, let's move on to the next one. So our next game is The Blinding of the Light by The Happiest Camper. Alright, fellas, I think we have a new record for the barest game description I've ever seen. All it says here is, it's been a while since I've made one of these. Uh, okay. Um, the only real thing of note I can find is that it was apparently submitted to some thing where you need to make a game within one hour. It doesn't appear to be some kind of contest or even a game jam, but instead just an event a bunch of people did for fun. Actually, looking through the entries, a lot of these games here appear to be made with just default RM assets as well, so... Heck, maybe if I ever do want to do another video like this, this could be a potential resource for finding games. Then again, a lot of them appear to be in French for whatever reason, so there might be a bit of a language barrier there. 
I'm getting off topic though, let's get back to the game. So, you start by playing as this old man named Julius, who the game implies is some sort of berserker who is also a war veteran. Um, you spawn on this never-ending mountain that you can't leave with only one statue to interact with. You do so, and then you get warped to the past. Huh. And I say it's the past too, because you play as a kid who just happens to have the exact same name, class, and even character description as the Elder we just saw. We suddenly hear a little girl calling for help, so we rip apart the rock face with our bare hands! <laughs> so that's why he's a berserker, and we find a cave. The cave, by the way, I think the encounter rate is way too high here. The monsters are extremely powerful as well, so they can kill you really easily. Thankfully, however, you can actually run from them all, and it doesn't appear as if you can fail to escape, which gives me the feeling that that's what you're supposed to do. Eventually, you find the girl. Her name is Natalie, and she has healing magic. You make your escape with the girl, but just as you're about to leave the, uh, leave the cave, uh, this evil vampire blocks your path. You fight him, but it appears to be an impossible battle, as he kills you, and then the game ends. Huh. You know, for something that was created with such a strict time limit, I guess I should have expected a pretty abrupt ending like that. So, what do I think? Honestly, I... I really like what's here already, and as expected, it's incredibly basic, but the writing is appropriately mysterious and actually pretty mature, and it got me really invested. Like, I was disappointed when it ended. You know, if this game did continue, I have a feeling what it might be going for is uh, somewhat of a chapter-based experience that jumps through multiple parts of this, uh, of this man's life. You know, getting a little older each time, until he's an elder, and we're back on top of the mountain, but this time, with more context to what he's actually doing there. You know, kinda like in To the Moon, which coincidentally is also made with RPG Maker. And I feel the exact story this dev will focus on is his love life. At the mountain, Julius prays to a statue of a woman, with love being his motivation, and the adventure of saving the little girl might very well be their first encounter. The game even mechanically shows you how important she is to him as well, as by the time you reach her, you'll likely be at low life and she has healing magic. That is really clever. This is a really cool idea for a game that I can totally get behind. I'm not sure if the dev will ever return this one, but it was pretty powerful for, for a first impression. Unfortunately though, that's all I kind of have to say about this one. Again, it was pretty short. So let's move on. So our next game is James vs. the Giant Pe- Wait, James vs. the Giant- Dang it, James vs. the World. What in the world was that about? By Team Cray- uh, Team uh, Kaiden. So there might actually be more than one person behind this one. James Wella is a normal boy from Laba Town. Laba is short for Limbra. Until one day when James and his three friends made a Ghostbuster type company after random enemies start appearing around Radical Thorset. But then they met a guy named Ron after a hole appeared in his room, but then shit got real. <laughs> I, I don't know why, but that really caught me off guard. Uh, it doesn't look like there's much here, but um, what's this? Bad news, Discord news, bad news, Mac OS version, coming soon. Well, at least they're inclusive. What is this bad news? I need to know. So as the title says, James vs. the World may get cancelled, aka not be completed. Why though? Well, for a while, the game has not been touched by me, only an update that it might release to Game Jolt, but that is it. Also, RPG Maker MV is confusing. Why? Well, one day I was wondering how to make a cutscene, and I went on YouTube, and I only got how to make a intro cutscene in RPG Maker MV. But now that I searched it, more videos of how to make a cutscene appeared, but now I know how to make one, so that is it. By the way, I am making a Reddit for submissions to the game. Yes, that makes perfect sense. I understand everything now. Oh my god, what am I getting myself into here? I haven't even started the game and I already feel like I'm going mad. Okay, you know what? Who dares wins? Let's just bite the bolt and jump into this. So we got a... Uh, um... What? So, the first real oddity I noticed of this is that you actually start with a full team of four, which, uh, by the way, that's the only time this is gonna happen in this video. Yeah, this is the only game out of these five where you actually have a team of four at any given point. Although, for whatever reason, your party consists of 
only James and then the four factory default heroes MV projects always start with, like literally. Also, this banana yellow menu color is not easy on the eyes. The first thing I did was walk up to this woman who gave me some free gold. And then I discovered that you can do it forever! Like seriously, you can do this forever. All right, fellas, you think that's enough to start the game with? Our first location is, uh, Ah, Labad Town, my favorite. I've heard legends of this place. There's plenty to do here. You could visit your own house, you could go to Jill Shop, where it's customary to stand on the counter, and then you can tell the mayor of the place to, uh... Man, we got an edgelord on our hands. Exiting to your left will take you to... Radical Forset. It's actually called that. I thought that was just a typo in the game description. The battling in this game is incredibly basic. It's a bit more dynamic than the battle systems we've seen so far, like, a bit, but it's still a little too basic for its own good. Lucius hits the dab and attacks. Hold on a second. Tags, dab, and, and uh, memes. Oh lord, we got a meme game on our hands. You know, I was actually joking about that when I said it in the intro. After a while, you reach a house where you meet Ron, who tells you to go upstairs to... Who the heck is John? Is this Ron or John's house? Make up your mind game. Warning, this level may have a ton of swearing, including... What is this, the four words you can't say in the RPG Maker community? Okay, I promise I'm not the type who complains about if a game swears or is profane. It's just... Something about how this game uses profanity just seems very, I'm 14 and this is edgy to me. Like, honestly, I just can't take any of this seriously. You then teleport to a... What the heck is going on? I cannot describe what happens in the game at this point. Hello, I'm... Mm? There is a why we're we red house there. Uh, okay, and then go into... Oh god, that tile set. I'm Mayor Hell. Who are you? Passants. Who is Passant? Now, at this point, I'm actually kind of stuck. I don't know how you're supposed to advance here. When you talk to this Satan guy, you get three options. The first two do nothing, and the last one sends you all the way back to the beginning of the game with no health left because you were so mean. Yeah, I'm the mean one. I played through the entire game again, but I cannot for the life of me find a way to get past this guy, nor can I find any sort of alternative route. So am I just stuck now? Is this the end? I don't really care anymore, honestly. You can kind of tell the devs had fun making this one, but it's very incomprehensible on its own merits and just makes no sense whatsoever. Fun fact though, as I was editing this part of the video, I discovered that it does actually updated this game, claiming to have added two endings and a boss battle. Do I have the patience to play this game again just to see that? Honestly, no. However, as per usual, I will leave a link to this in the game description below if anyone would like to try it themselves. I, however, need to move on before I completely lose my mind. Alright, I think we know the drill by now. Our next game has probably my favorite name out of this collection. It is Dude Knight by Azure Guild. A short, humorous adventure of a knight called Dude that suddenly became a knight. He got a legendary stick to start his journey. No one know the power of the stick. Will Dude use the stick in the right path or no? You will need the RPG Maker Ace RTP to run this game. Oh dang, you actually need the RTP to play this one. This sometimes happens with games like this. When you compile an RPG Maker game, you have the option to compile it with or without the game's default assets. I typically opt to leave them on. On one hand, a game compiled without the assets will have a small file size, which is useful for uploading and distributing it, especially if your game just happens to use no default assets whatsoever. That's kind of rare, but it does occasionally happen. And even if it does, there's a good chance the kinds of people who would play your game, such as fellow RM devs playing your obscure game for a comical YouTube video, for example, will. And at that point, the process to add them is literally just a drag and drop job. On the other hand, it makes your title not as approachable since not everyone will be able to download or own the assets themselves. It also causes the game to have some problems in that the second the game attempts to pull up any graphic or audio file whatsoever that isn't in the files, it'll crash! 
Like, seriously. Export your games with the RTP and tack people, trust me, it'll save your player base a lot of headache in the long run. Anyway, where was I? Oh, yeah, Dude Night. So, uh, we start with, um... <sighs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Dang it, this song is burnt into the soul of every RM dev, I swear. So, we start the game with, uh, basically nothing. No items, no skills, no equipment. All we know is that we're a dude, we're a knight, and we're also a... a noob. That's not even how you spell that word, what the heck? So we leave the starring area and, uh... Wait, what? I can't leave. Huh. For whatever reason, I can't seem to exit the starting area. I've tried everything, circling around the place several times, resetting the game, examining every tile. For whatever reason, it doesn't appear you can actually leave this forest room, though. Now, if you look on the game's page, you'll notice that there are screenshots of locations aside from this room, so I know for a fact that there is more to this game, I just can't seem to access it for whatever reason. And it seems this game was compiled in such a way that I can't dig into the game files either and figure out for myself. Now, I know there's probably still a way to get in there, but I'm too lazy and inept to figure it out right now. I think I unfortunately might need to end this one here then. I might reach out to the dev at some point regarding this, who knows, maybe he just forgot to put an exit there and the game is fully functional aside from that. Quite unfortunate though, if this game ever does get fixed, I might have another look at it again someday, but for now, however, let's just move on to the fifth and final game. Well. Here we are, we're at the final title already, and uh, this one is Wayfarers, or Wayfarers, by, um, uh, Wayfarers. Huh? Okay, it's not often I see a developer have the exact same name as, the, as its game. Typically when that happens, it's because the game is incredibly one-off from what they typically create, or it's some kind of magnum opus. But like, seriously though, I can't for the life of me find some kind of name or even an Erna alias attached to this project. And this project does have like, a Twitter, a Tumblr, and even an Instagram, and I still can't really find anything. So I guess for the time being, the dev is purely anonymous here? Quite strange, I don't think I've ever seen something like this before. Typically you can find like, some kind of Erna alias or something. Anyway, let's get back into the game, and uh, let's actually go through the game description. Harry, a boy determined to travel all seven realms of Pangaea to find his mother's people, finds himself in the middle of a conspiracy. Accompanied by two young adventurers, Archie and Lily, Harry sets out to uncover the truth behind his mother's fate. Interesting. Well, it doesn't have any typos in it, so that's a good start. Alright, let's give this one a try and uh, see what we got. Oh my god. No hyperbole, that was without a question the best game in this entire collection. And okay, I know the bar is kind of low here since I've just been playing a bunch of broken meme games today, but hear me out. Wayfarers is amazing. It's only about a half hour long, which actually makes it the longest game in the collection, but that aside, this game has a good story, really good writing, good pacing, some incredibly fun characters, a sense of artistry and a surety that a lot of effort was put into it, and a real true understanding of the RPG Maker engine and how to harness it for amazing potential. Unfortunately though, this is the kind of game that's difficult to praise without just reciting the entire plot, so um, let's do just that. Trust me, there is a reason why I'm not talking about, like, the battle system or the gameplay first, but we'll get to that later. So, we start with a flashback sequence of some soldiers burning down a tent village, and then we are brought 17 years into the future where we meet our hero, Perry. This scene right here, I think, perfectly encapsulates the kind of writing that highlights why I like this game so much. So, we got these three bandits here cornering him in a warehouse, and they're after this medallion that belonged to his late mother. He spouts some cheesy one-liners and then takes them out, but then suddenly, uh, Perry, why are the lights off? Okay, like, that's awesome! 
I love everything about this opening scene. It introduces these two characters of Perry and his dad slash boss Clark exceptionally well. It pulls a fun subversion of expectations with these dummies, and it also tells us a little bit about the world. These two work as warehouse suppliers in the small town of Compen. They're both very experienced at their trade, despite Perry not having his license yet. There are apparently embargoes and backhanded politics going on in the outside world that makes their work more difficult, and they also have a rival named Flint. Anyway, just as you're about to close shop for the day, this guy walks in and collapses at your front desk. Your dad recognizes him. His name is apparently Ray, but he won't tell you anything about him and leaves shortly afterwards. He tells you to go home, but then suddenly someone else walks in. Salutations, fellow adolescent. Although you are what appears to be prematurely concluding your business, could you provide me with some information? This guy is awesome and is easily my favorite character in the entire game. So at this point, the game reveals that it actually plans to be somewhat chapter-based, as we're now told the story of how this guy got here. His name is apparently Archie, and he comes from a far-off land via train to visit Compen on an important mission. The train gets attacked, however, by rogues, leading to a harrowing scenario where you cause a guy to throw up, uh, so you can sneak into the frontmost train and fix the problem yourself. All with that cheerful smile on your face, eat your heart out, XY protagonist. Also, can I ask a question? What in the world is this theme that plays during this entire chain train sequence here? It's playing in the background right now. I really like it, and it sounds incredibly familiar, but I can't seem to put my finger on what exactly it is. Anyway, after that little adventure, you arrive in the small town and actually avoid the guards just as they were getting curious as to why a kid was able to fix the train so effortlessly. Ah, uh, looks like this one's never played an RPG, guys. Doesn't he know that kids are always more capable than adults? At this point, you go around town for a bit, eavesdrop on some folks, and then it's revealed that this is one of those rare instances where a fantasy world has multiple currencies. Like, seriously, why is that so rare? Well, I guess maybe if you give a restaurant a currency it's not used to it, get real pissed off, and then have you work off your bill of menial labor, I guess that could be a one potential reason why, but, but it works here. It's good world building. It's good world building. And then the flashback ends when you make your way back to Perry's shop. But then another person comes in, and they kind of poke fun at this, which I kind of love. Now we're introduced to Lily, the third character of this trio, and then we get her flashback as well. Not nearly as much happens with her, however, she's apparently with the guards of Compen and was present during the train attack. She follows one of the raiders, though, and discovers a secret passage that she can't really do anything about. Uh, you then report back to your superior, who's also your sister, who you're apparently having some drama with, and then you do some errands. Like, seriously, you just play errand boy for a bit. Um, after that, you learn a little bit about Archie, and then connect the dots that you should go to Perry's shop next, and then these three stories line up once again. After that, you and Archie head out to go meet Dad back home. When you get there, Archie and Clark start talking in mystery. Archie was sent by a guy named Leo, and was instructed to tell Clark that the planets are aligning. Clark then takes out a book, and then the game ends. Oh man, what a wild ride. So, why do I like this game so much? Well, I think the biggest reason as to why has to do with the game's presentation and its writing. I mentioned earlier that one of the downsides to making a game with default assets is that you need to do something extra in order to stand out. And this game accomplishes that by using its assets in clever and very professional ways. And by having a lot of fun of its narrative and writing style. The story itself might not sound that unique, in fact it's a little cliche as far as RPGs go, but it's a game that's smart enough to run with it on top of getting all the little things right. The game is also surprisingly comedic sometimes. I didn't really go over this much, but a lot of the NPCs you can talk to have some really funny lines that I found quite memorable, and the game itself even pokes fun at its weirder aspects. My favorite example of uh, doubt has got to be the entire existence of Archie. So. Do you remember when you were a kid and doing some creative writing for school or something? You always went on to thesaurus.com, looked up random words in your assignment, and then just replaced it with the longest word to come up? You know, because it made you feel smarter? Is that just me? Well, anyway, Archie's entire dialogue is written in that kind of manner. An increase in wealth is hardly a suitable motivation for me. I am in need of organic sustenance. So, a meal. Indeed! 
Indeed! Judging by the sudden vibration of the cart and eruption sound, I am hypothesizing an explosion. Here is the desired amount as well as a small addition due to stellar service you have provided. According to the gardener's requirements, these cobs of corn aren't ready! And the unbelievable part too is that there's actually a story reason for this. He apparently comes from some city where technology is really advanced and everyone just talks like that there. Although, that's not how normal people talk, and the game is very self-aware of this elitist way of speaking. Townsfolks even describe him as just that kid who talks funny. It's so good. So, now is I think a good time to bring up something that, to me, was kind of an elephant in the room at first. And that's that, well, uh, there are no battles in Wayfarers. Like, seriously, this game is 100% walking to cutscenes. Now, I thought this was weird at first until I took another look at the game's page, and I finally noticed that the game is actually labeled as a visual novel. Now, this I found strange at first because, I don't know about you guys, but whenever I think visual novel, I tend to think first person camera, character right in front of you, you know. This game, however, is from a more classical top-down perspective. I find this doubly strange too because as of the time this game released, I think Visual Novel Maker was a thing, which coincidentally is a software I'm trying to figure out how to use myself now. For those of you who don't know, RPG Maker and Visual Novel Maker are both made by the same team, uh, Degisa, I think that's how you say it, or at least they're both published by the same team. I know there is a difference there. Um, but there are a lot of similarities between the two softwares, especially with MV, which is the most recent version of RPG Maker. So it just kind of makes me wonder why the dev of this game didn't bother using that. Um, but then I thought a little harder about it, and I realized that the dev probably made the best decision possible here. Unlike a lot of visual novels, Wayfarer's fancies itself in being a lot more cinematic than the average game of that genre. It's surprisingly action-packed for a visual novel, and the ability to actually walk around and talk with people adds a nice layer of depth to the world building as well. I'd be lying if I said that the visual novel genre didn't feel incredibly homogenized at times, and as a result, this is actually a really interesting take on how to create one. One thing I do kind of have a problem with regarding this approach, though, is how static the characters themselves are. One thing I've always felt made visual novels strong is their ability to characterize their cast surprisingly well with a variety of effects and their enormous array of sprites per character. Here, though, all we have are these tiny generated character portraits that really don't do much more than let us know who's talking. The game combats this a bit by tapping into its inner golden sun and making the overworld sprites more, more emotive and move around during cutscenes, which is just something more games in general should do. But I kind of wish the game went a bit farther with this and, say, had larger body sprites for characters too, with a number of sprites per character for different emotions. Kind of like in games like Eternal Eyes, for example. You know, for like the three of you who have actually played this one. Like seriously folks, have any of you ever played this one? It was one of my favorite games as a kid, but I don't think I've ever met anyone who so much has heard of it. Man, maybe I should make a video about it one of these days. So yeah, Wayfarer's kind of rules. You know, I'm glad out of all of these games I looked at today, there was at least one that I liked so much that I could see myself recommending it to people who aren't even into RPG Maker games. No offense to any of the other games I took a look at today, it's just clear, I think, at this point that this is the one I like the most. Really, the only thing left to mention about Wayfair is that it's actually not finished yet. At the current moment, it's just labeled as a demo, and while I'm not sure what the current status on the potential final release is, let me tell you folks, I would love to return this once it's done. Heck, maybe this video will give the dev a bit of motivation, because like, seriously, please continue this, I will play it. I might even let's play it, because my god, this game got me invested. So now that we've had a look at every game, I think now's the time for some closing thoughts. I'm going to go ahead and rank these games from my least favorite to my favorite. My least favorite of the bunch is probably Dude Knight, unfortunately. Albeit, that game was kind of broken, so I couldn't really play much of it, honestly, and establish a concrete opinion. After that is Blinding of the Light, which, let's be real here, the only fundamental problem with that game was how short it was, and even then there was a reason why it's so short, it's because the game had to be built in an hour. I really like the subtle story that one was trying to tell, and if the dev ever want to elaborate on it in the future, I'm sure it would be something amazing to, to, to go through. After that, I'd probably rank James vs. the World. At the end of the day, I recognize that it is just a dumb meme game, but to be honest, there was still parts of it that I legitimately found pretty funny. 
Particularly, I just got a good laugh out of how undeniably unpredictable the entire game was. You literally never knew what was going to happen next. Crown of Chaos is probably my number two pick. Don't get me wrong, this game feels very amateurish in a lot of different ways. However, the game itself is fundamentally sound, and it has a lot of potential with that dream idea, if the dev was going for that in the first place. This feels almost like the first project of someone trying to figure out how the engine works for the very first time, and hey, it's not a bad first attempt. And then there's Wayfarers, which is just awesome. I, spent, I just spent a bunch of time praising it. I think we all know my opinions on this title by now. And you know what, before we end this video for the day, let's talk about a couple additional miscellaneous RPG Maker games that just happened to also use mostly default assets. Because in a way, they did sort of inspire me to make this video. These are all games I've also Let's Played in the past too, so if they sound interesting to you, there's an easy place to check them out if you want to see what they're like. I'll also leave links to their uh, game pages in the description below. The first one I want to mention is The Princess's Heart by Rose Portal Games. Uh, this game is incredibly well designed from start to finish, with some really memorable characters, bosses, an interesting gimmick involving how it handles the characters' turn orders, and even some fun optional areas and challenges. Another one I want to mention is Chronicles Fate of a Princess by Descado. Um, I'm just now noticing how both of these games have to do with princesses. <laughs> Well, anyway, uh, this one had a pretty fantastic story, some really good dungeon design, and a brilliant way to handle its class system for the main character that actually encourages some replayability. And not to toot my own horn here, but uh, I've also made a game using mostly default assets. Say hello to Tamer Island. It is very amateurishly made being my first full game made with the engine, but God dang it, I put a lot of heart into it, and I'm proud of my little ugly duckling of an RPG. It emphasizes collecting, which is something I like doing in RPGs, and I promise you will have at least one good laugh playing this. Maybe not something I intended you to laugh at, but you will laugh. It's a special key that can unlock anything on the island. Why are you telling me all I don't this? know why I'm telling you this. Oh my though. god! <laughs> Alright, I go down the strange man's basement. Oh yeah, this is a cult. He's gonna sacrifice you. <laughs> We're gonna fight the captain again, but he's weak. <laughs> and a special mention I want to throw in here at the end is At Last Alone Risen by DJ Beardo. Um, and the reason it's a special mention is because this game is actually not made with default assets. However, I thought it was since the style looks so professional. Um, the dev informed me this mistake I made in a rough draft of this video I uploaded, and apparently I'm not the only one to ever make this mistake either. However, I still want to mention it here anyway, because, like, seriously, look at it. It's an isometric tactics game made of RPG Maker. <laughs> the technical know-how that must have gone into this still blows my mind. Links to all of these titles I mentioned today will be in the description below. Go check them out and give the devs some love. And if you know of any other fantastic games that are made with default assets, feel free to share them below. Who knows, maybe I can make a part two of this one of these days. So that won't be it to today. Um, as per track record of me, this video ended up being a lot longer than I expected. I honestly thought it was going to clock up to about 20 minutes at first. Um, it went way beyond that. However, that's perfectly fine because I love talking about topics like this. Um, as per usual, feel free to give this video a like if you enjoyed it, maybe subscribe if you want to see more from me, and I also got my Twitter and Discord too to continue the conversation, and some occasional behind-the-scenes stuff. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video, and thanks for watching.